Hi guys, welcome to episode 76 of my uh, Warhammer 40k Conquest review series. I'm Warhammer Dad, um, and this episode we'll be reviewing issue 76 in a move that surprises absolutely no one. <coughs> Sorry. Let's get this open. And take a look at the plastic. Um, this week we've got part two of the Primaris kit. Um, we've got the bottom and the two sides. <clears throat> I don't know if you can actually start building it yet or or what. <clears throat> Maybe get some of the bits together. I don't know. You'd have to have a look. I think I suspect you could put some of the pieces together. <clears throat> but frankly, uh, <clears throat> a lot of these models rely on their completed structure provided with strength. So... Personally, I'd wait till you got all four. <coughs> Just means you're less likely to break it. <coughs> Here we can see we've got the main undercarriage with some nice um, floor detailing inside. Um, GW always do details to the inside of the tanks in case you want to open them up. Um, I tend to find that they're the strongest and most stable and travel the best when they're not opened up and when the doors that aren't sticking out and things like that. So stuff can't. So let, there's less stuff to snap off. But a lot of the detail is put in there. So if you want to use them as part of a diorama piece. With guys getting in and out you can. Um, you've got the sides there with a nice little foot plate to help you climb up to the top. Um, a lot of these bits here. Are part of the gravity of the anti-gravity plating. And you've got a lot of very nice um, very deep detail on this. Um, not too much, a lot of blank services as well. But all in all, a, a nice piece of plastic. And we'll get to see what it looks like when uh, we get to issue 78, where we have all of the bits and we can perhaps even put it together. Right, okay. So let's have a quick look as to what we've got in the magazine. Um, as always, uh, the signature of Ian R. Spiritual Liege. <sighs> I don't know what we do without it. <sighs> uh, this issue, it jumps straight into Tech Marines. <sighs> That's a Tech Marine. And one of the things I like about the Tech Marines is they're not the Tech Priests. They um, have uh, the knowledge of, a certain amount of knowledge of Tech Priests. And they have a certain amount of reverence for the Machine Spirit. And they certainly follow a certain amount of the Tech Priests religion but they're also at the same time they're very different they're not continually trying to become one with a machine god they consider their marine bodies to be augmented and enhanced enough or at least as much as the emperor ever the emperor ever intended to be um so they're still very much <coughs> marines albeit of a slightly different god which is cool and it makes them mysterious <coughs> here we can see we have some of the old pre-heresy armor Um, a lot of the old armor takes more um, maintenance, uh, more repairing. So um, it makes sense that Tech Marines get it. Uh, they've got the time to and the um, and the know-how to repair it. So they they're the ones that are they're the ones that get it because they're the ones that can stick it together. <coughs> um, I'll go through a bit of the blurb here. Um, it goes: Some marine some marines have great command of war machines. These warriors train with the Adeptus Mechanicus and join the machine cult. So, like I said, they do follow certain parts of the um, Martian law, but it's apparent from looking at them, not all of it. Um, they become tech marines. They have knowledge of the Omnicide's great mysteries. They know many holy rites you, um, used to activate and repair machines. Uh, and this knowledge is crucial in keeping the chapter's weaponry and war machines working in full order. It's worth noting a lot of the big machines that the Imperium uses are repaired and maintained by the Mechanicus. Or at least you, know, you have a tech priest um, and a lot, maybe a lot of um, servitors or even just normal citizens working under his uh, command. Um, whether you're talking about the massive ships of the Imperial Navy, um, the guns of the Imperial Guard, a lot of it at the end of the day needs maintenance by a tech priest. 
Um, yes, they have basic mechanics in the Imperial Guard, but those guys don't have necessarily the knowledge to rebuild an entire machine. Again, this is kind of holy knowledge um, maintained by the Tech Priests. Um, the Space Marines, because they have and were always meant to be a completely self-contained fighting force, they have their own Tech Marines who are, you know, their equivalent of the Tech Priests who maintain their stuff for them and even invent stuff. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the uh, Predator variants was actually invented by the Space Wolves, weirdly enough, in the background. I think it's the one with the twin last cannons that Blood Angels like to use. Um, <clears throat> and for years, uh, the tech the tech was like, oh, no, you can't use that. It's, it's, it's heretic tech. And then because it proved so successful, they magically and mysteriously found things. Oh, look, here's, here's one somebody invented earlier that's exactly the same, so we can use that now. <clears throat> and there are, uh, there are a, a few other examples of tech marines actually inventing stuff um, because they're more marine, they're as much marine or more marine than they are tech priest. They are a bit freed from the constraints of tech priest, so that's pretty cool. Um, next page, some more about tech priests. Uh, the highest ranking tech priest in each chapter is Master of the Forge. Um, these skilled engineers have proved that they understand the machine gods' mysteries. Their understanding of the Machine Gold's mysteries is almost as great as that of the Martian Tech Major, right? So they're pretty cool. It also goes on to give you, and that's a, a little um, bit of the Thunderfire Cannons, which is a little cannon often manned and operated by Tech Priests. Um, when the solution causes sheer firepower open mobility, a Tech Marine may bring one of the Armory's Thunderfire Cannons to war. These huge quad bowed artillery guns. They're a big gun for a single model. They're not a huge gun compared to, for example, the guns and tanks. Um, can fire and reload at an incredible rate, unleashing salvo after salvo of explosive shells. They can even fire burrowing rounds known as tremor shells. Um, and there you've got a picture of one of them that they can wheel around. Um, usually in the miniatures you can have, you can take a tech marine, you can add a thun you can have a Thunderfire cannon and or you can have some servitors that are armed either with close combat weapons or um, ranged weaponry which the um, which the Tech Marine can use as well. Uh, well which, not the enemy, which the which are part of the Tech Marine squadron you can use as well. Um, next we've got how to build the primary repulsor. little keen I think but uh, there you can see you've got some of the bits we got last week are along there and then some of the bits we got this week are along there so you can at least make a start on assembling it just let the dog out as always um, important instruction on clipper safety and glue safety then we've got some of the instructions on how to build the base stuff. Again, whether or not you want to start building this stuff now, or whether or not you want to wait, even if you can build some of the stuff, is up to you. As I say, a lot of the strength of these bits and pieces comes from the fact that they're all built together. Um, and so they form a box, which is a, a, a strong shape. So you might want to wait um, if your house is a house, like one that's particularly chaotic, where you have a likelihood of something getting dropped or broken or knocked off the shelf. And again, we've got, this one has quite a few instructions, multiple pages, in fact, um, because this is the biggest, um, this is the biggest and most complex thing we built to date. So it runs through all the instructions. Don't lose these. These are going to be very useful. A lot of the stuff I build, I don't tend to look at the instructions because I like to figure it out myself. But with the tanks, um, even I always check the instructions first. It's a pain in the ass to stick something wrong. There's a lot of optional weapons, a lot of things you can use or you can use in multiple ways. Um, as it shows you there, you have a lot of choices, which also means you're going to get a lot of bits for your bits box, which is always fun. And there and. Again, just there and there, more bits and pieces um, and stuff like that. I'm just going to flick through. Oop. Boom. That's a lot of pages. 
I'm just going to go back and give it a count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oops, I'm knocking off the camera there. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That's 16 pages of instructions. <clears throat> but trust me, they are actually very useful to have. Um, you don't get this many instructions normally in uh, in space, in um, Games Workshop stuff. Um, if you've got any concerns about building a vehicle like this, um, particularly if uh, you're new to the hobby and started with a Conquest thing and you haven't built anything like this previously, um, don't worry yourself too much. It's your model. If you break it, it's no one's problem but yours. Um, and you can often fudge it. But um, <clears throat> there are YouTube videos. I might, if I've got time, get a YouTube video up myself. But there are YouTube videos giving you instructions on how to, on how to build these models um, step by step. If you do watch those YouTube videos, watch them from start to finish and then go and build along with them because on some of them, people will make a mistake and they go, oh, sugar, and they'll correct that mistake. And you might find that you just do it and then you leave it and then you come back and the next part of the video is, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And you're like, oh, it's stuck now. Whereas the guy on the video has time to, you know, it might be dry fitting or might be uh, gluing and have time to take it off quickly and you might not. Uh, you might stop the video at an inopportune place and leave it because you've got to go make a cup of tea, come back and then find out you made a mistake. Or in in the case of myself and one of my colleagues um, in the shop I used to own, we put some of our scenery together with super glue, uh, whereas the video we watched, a uh, gentleman was putting it together with wood glue because it was MDF laser cut scenery. And he made about three or four errors, which he then went back and corrected. And because he'd used wood glue, he could. We'd use super glue. We were like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> Apologies for me. So it's always worth watching these videos all the way through to make sure, A, you know where you're going next. And B, if the guy on the video makes mistakes, and we're all human and fallible, you can, um, <clears throat> you can, uh, Check on that. I have gone remarkably quickly through this video because so much of it was instruction. Uh, no painting guides on, on this one, um, so can't go through the painting guides. Um, here we've got Nowhere to Run, a nice, awesome little story. I do like these stories. I can't recommend reading these things enough. They're not the most amazing stories in the world. You've only, they've only got a paragraph to get stuff across. Um, but, uh, so I'm just looking at my dog. Um, but they are really good for inspiring you to the upcoming battle. Okay, next we've got um, the battle plan, which is Scorn Asunder. Death Guard forces advancing on Scorn have already penetrated the city limits and are heading for the central plaza and Space Marine operating base. They must capture this position. So, um, <sighs> nice and practical from the Death Guard's side. Um, the armies, both players must create a battleforged army with a maximum power, aging, power rating of 40. Um, sorry, both deployment zones are shown on the map above. This time you've got diagonal deployment zones. Um, in the book, that's one of the standard deployment zones you can roll. It's actually quite interesting because um, it kind of forces bunch ups and um, various bits and changes very much the way you, um, the way you uh, lay out your army. It's not literally, oh, you just move it the way you would lay it out end to end onto the onto the corner. Because of the different shape of the deployment zone, it causes a lot of interesting tactical nuances and problems. So it, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, to battle for a roll off and starting with the winner take turns placing the battle mats in the layout shown above, which is standard. Set up the terrain in an agreed manner, which is standard. Both players place two objective markers. Roll to see you place the first. They must be placed more than six inches from a battlefield edge and more than eight inches from each other, so that's fairly easy. Um, <clears throat> uh, deployment zones. Both deployment zones are shown on the map above. Both players roll off and the winner chooses their deployment zone. Um, the players then alternate deploying their units, beginning with the players chosen to deploy first. The player who finished setting up their army first takes turn, takes the first turn. Uh, the victory conditions. 
Eliminating an enemy unit is one point. Having an enemy unit in the deployment zone at the end of the game is one point. In the enemy deployment zone at the end of the game, sorry, that's pretty important. Um, control an objective marker, one victory point. You control an objective marker if you have more models within three inches of it than, than the enemy at the end of the game. And the battle lasts five rounds. So nice, a nice straightforward game that relies on on you advancing and on you holding your own territory so it's it's it sound it's fairly straightforward and fairly simple but games like this do actually offer a lot of nuance because you have three objectives you need to maintain and you need to decide whether you want to maintain all of them whether you just want to pick two or what you want to do so you want to keep the enemy out of your deployment zone or at least outnumber them in your deployment zone you want to you want to get the enemy out of their deployment zone and get your enemy and get your troops into their deployment zone, or at least outnumber them in their deployment zone. And you've got two um, two uh, my brain just failed there. Two objective markers to carry. And I'm gonna actually put a little more comment on this one. I used to play games like this quite a lot, and Excuse me, I can't see my dog. I'm just going to go and get my dog. Sorry about that. She's a big girl. She's gone to five stone or at the moment, which is quite big for a dog. <clears throat> she has a tendency to dig up the garden. Anyway, talking about dogs. Um, <clears throat> I primarily play Space Wolves or Space Wolf variant chapters. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and I've often played games like this where you've got to sort of think about, do you want to defend your own line? Or do you want to go for the others? And there's two way. There's several ways of doing this. Um, I say two. There's there's really three ways of doing it. One, you try and do all three. Two, you stick to defending your own zone and grabbing a couple of objectives, or grabbing one objective and then hoping that the enemy can't, and then just denying the enemy theirs. Or three, you abandon your uh, your your uh, deployment zone completely and just go to take out the objectives and the enemy deployment zone. Now. One thing I used to do, which I'm going to mention here so that either you can do it or you can avoid having it done to you, is the enemy, is my opponent would <coughs> set up the battlefield. He'd set up uh, one um, objective near his own end so that he could get it. And I'd set up one objective near his own end so that he could get it. So that he could get it, so that I could get it. <coughs> um, and then when he go, went forward and he'd get the objectives, I would just barrel towards his end of the battlefield with everything I had. It's just, you know, I'd place it there and I'd place, I'd place the objective near him and he'd go, are you sure you want to do that there? You want to near your own objective? So I'd go, well, why? I'm not going to be there. And, uh, you know, I would play a very aggressive, very aggressive space wolf uh, system. I'd often try, yeah, I'd often try for refused, refused flank. And if I could separate his army at all, I would. Um, but, you know, he'd, stay, he'd have some in his zone. He'd send some out to get the objectives and send some out to get my zone. I'd munch on the... I'd move everything forward, munch on the things that had come to me, then munch on the stuff that was going to the objective, and then munch on the third part of his army. <clears throat> you know, I'd either do that or I'd try and divide it with a few flank, and I basically I'd take his army on piecemeal with the whole of my army. Um, it's quite an effective tactic, and it served me well. It did also bite me in the arse a couple of times. Um, the only reason I mention it is because it is worth considering what you want to do i mean if the objectives for example are both near your end why send it you know take that take both the objectives and sit on it with your whole army why spread your army out um when you can try and force your opponent to do so um and if you've got for example both objectives and your deployment zone that's three victory points if he eliminates um an enemy so if he eliminates one enemy unit you know he gets a victory point, but then again so do you when you clash so those victory points will come to you anyway. So, you know, if you're if you're roughly equal skill, your armies are well balanced, and you're eliminating guys at the same thing. If you can just sit on your deployment zone with an objective, or with two or with two objectives, or you can abandon your your deployment zone entirely and sit in his deployment zone with two objectives, that can often get you the win. So you know, it is one of those ones where there is actually quite a lot of tactical nuance in this um, because you're not facing a single objective you're facing multiple objectives and you can 
literally decide to abandon some of them. They go, well, those are going to be too hard. I don't have to get all the objectives. I just have to get more objectives than the other guy to win. So um, <clears throat> that can be really cool. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. It isn't just a matter of <clears throat> fight every objective and then realise that, you know, he's also fighting every objective and you're all spread across a battlefield. There is a lot of fun to be had in that, but if your opponent has decided to not try for certain objectives and con to concentrate his firepower, you can also sometimes find that he'll eat two-thirds of your army with, with the whole of his army because he has a significant advantage. And then, you know, he'll lose troops as well, but he'll probably have half of his army left after that. And then you'll have a third of your army left after that. So he'll be able to come after the rem the rem the rem the, rem the remnants of your army or the remaining third of your army with, again, a numbers advantage. So, you know, it... <sighs> Games like this that are simpler are often my favourite and more fun because they actually have a lot of tactical nuance in them. You know, the more complex the game, the more complex the objectives, the more you tend to have to ride, you know, ride the rails and do that thing, um, which is a lot of fun because it's very uh, thematic, but you get less options, you get less sand pitting, you get less things that you can choose to do. But that's also cool as well, but that's why you have, that's why you have the different types of game, because each one of them has different things to do, different tactical styles, and you know, an, an open game like that versus a game with a solid tactical objective like some of the previous ones we've had can feel completely different to play and can require completely different, completely different tactics. And there's one thing I can, looking back on this series, say is they've given us a lot of really good missions um, that really will task um, your gaming and... Um, will also teach you a lot about the different styles of game. So, you know, I can't recommend actually going through these missions enough um, and then be aware, obviously, that when you move to a six by four table, which is the standard size for a full scale battle, everything changes again because of this movement. Um, next page, we've got the Citadel color system. Um, contrary to popular belief, paint is not just a pain. Although you can do this job with a lot of things. Um, Citadel have several different styles of paint. And it's important to have a rough idea what the difference is. I mean, I'm actually going to go through this. Um, you've got the base paints. Uh, Citadel has over 50 base paints for you to choose from. Each is designed to give excellent coverage when painted over an undercoat. Giving your model their primary colour. Um... The undercoat is the base coat you paint on. It doesn't even have to be non. It doesn't even have to be completely covered, because its sole purpose is to get um, the paint to stick rather than anything else. Uh, some people use spray coats as undercoats. Some people paint black. Some people paint white. Uh, some people paint grey. Uh, some people just use the base colour they're going to use and then just go over that a couple of times. Um, I'd encourage you to try all these methods out because they all yield slightly different results. Um, you don't tend to notice them very much when doing it, apart from obviously the fact that some of the lighter colours like white and yellow struggle more over black base coats. Um, but prime example is things with black base coats. A, if you make a mistake, there's a little bit of black there and people don't tend to notice it rather than a bit of bright, uh, bright white poking out. So they can make painting quickly uh, a lot easier. Um, but they, they'll also make the model appear darker. Uh, white base coats, can take a, certain colors will go over white a lot more easily than they'll go over black, um, yellows, metallics, and things like that. <sighs> you can find you get better coverage over over white because it doesn't push through as much as the black. But also, white base coat can give you a lighter feeling to the models. You know, when you put them on the battlefield next to each other, things in white base white base coats the bright colors tend to pop a little more, whereas things in black base coats the um, the colors tend to be a little more subdued. And that's really a matter of style. Grey base coat, as you can imagine, goes in between. And painting, uh, base coating stuff with the colour you're going to do, um, with the, you know, the colour you're going to paint them, is really easy and convenient as well. Um, and it will pop or not pop, um, or seem subdued, depending on what your base and main colour is. Uh, that works well for more 40k models and more of the Imperial stuff, because the Imperium wears uniforms, which are often 
single coloured or mostly one coloured, you'll find you'll find it not as effective <coughs> for things like harlequins and um, perhaps tyranids where you want them to be multicoloured beasts. Um, also, with noting that the base coats tend to be a little thicker, which is so they can be watered down a little more because GW understands the paint you're going to use the most of, most of is your base coat. Um, next, we've got the contrast. Contrast go over base coats, um, ideally over the specific contrast base coats. <sighs> They're like a thick wash. They're a way of quickly painting models. They can give you a very nice finish. Um, unfortunately, the nicer the finish you want to look, the less work the contrast paint is doing. Um, if you're dry brushing and shadowing and that, then you're doing what the contrast paint is meant to do, which is raising and lowering areas. So it becomes less necessary to use a contrast paint, but they are very efficient. They are very good. And if you're painting large armies, they really are, they're time savers. That is their sole thing. Um, if you've got an airbrush, you can use that instead. Some people prefer dry brushing. There are lots of different things. There's no wrong way of doing it because it, the only person who gets to decide whether it worked is you. Um, there's no, as I say, the only, the only thing that could be wrong is if you paint it and you don't like it, then it's wrong. Um, but um, yeah, they're a real time saver. Uh, GW brought them out. I'm pretty sure in response to the fact that almost everybody was saying, oh, look at all these new models, but I've got such a backlog of unpainted models that I'm not gonna buy any new models, um, which partially is GW's fault because they just, they over the past few years, kind of since they changed their tune in 2016-ish, they bought fantastic box set and after fantastic box set, after cool mini game, after you know loads of things that you want to buy, um, just because they're all really cool. And you know, the models are really inspiring. Um, either that or they've used box sets to be kind of the spearhead of trialing um, armies out. Uh, the Gene Stealer cult army hadn't been used for years, decades. <clears throat> and they bought a couple of Gene Stealer box sets out as a way of getting the models out there. But because it was a self-contained game, people were buying, you know, they used Space Hulk, they used a couple of others. People were buying the games <clears throat> as well. So it saved GW's money, but, you know, it protected GW's money because some people buy it because they wanted the Gene Stealer armies. Other people buy it because they're thinking about it, but if they didn't, they still had a self-contained game. If they didn't get any more Gene Stealers, they were still good. Um... The unfortunate upshot of all this cool stuff is that a lot of people had a lot of models that they hadn't gotten around to painting because there was so much awesome stuff they wanted. And so GW went, oh, you're not buying because painting is taking too long. Okay, we'll find a solution. And their solution was contrast. <clears throat> it is in no way better or worse than their previous range. It's just quicker. Um, some people love the way it looks. Some people hate the way it looks. As with everything else, I encourage you to try it out for yourself. <clears throat> um, they've got dries. Um, the dry range are, they kind of look almost like putty. They're meant to look like that. Don't water them down. You put a little bit on the end of your brush. Uh, you scrape it, dry it off on the back of your hand, take off the excess or with a tissue paper, which is probably better than the back of your hand, but I always use the back of my hand. Um, and then you dry brush them on. There are some videos on this channel about dry brushing and about base coating and about some of the techniques I'm more familiar with. Uh, feel free to check them out to see what dry brushing is. But the dries are are basically um, another time saver. You've got the paint in the pot, it's ready to go. You, I'm not the thing again. You put your brush in, take the excess off, dry brush, and it's another time saver and a way of quickly say, uh, quickly painting your army. We've got layer paints. After you base coat your army, the layer paints are there to build up um, brightness and increased depth. They're not as thick as the base coats because you don't use as many of them, which means you don't have to water them down quite as much, um, but also means the um, price of the pot is cheaper. <coughs> Layer paints are primarily there for highlighting and for shadows and things like that, so they're pretty cool. You've got the shades, which are amazing. Um, the shades or the washes, whatever you want to call them, are thin paints they come in bigger bowls you can't really get how much bigger than the bowl it is because they've done a smaller picture but if the if you think that this bowl looks thinner than that bowl but in fact it is the same width it's just taller 
you get twice as much pain in those, but that's because you're going to use more. Um, but you're not paying twice as much of the price. They used to do them in the same pots, but it began to work out prohibitively expensive because you go through so much Agrax Earthshade when you're washing. You use more wash than you do base, in fact. But because it's a wash, it has to be thin, so you couldn't thicken it up. So what they did is they basically doubled the size. Um, it's worth noting also with the contrast, the pots there are slightly bigger because you use a lot more of it. You're not using, with the contrast, you're going base contrast. Um, without the contrast, you're going base dry layer. So they've made them a little bigger to make them a little bit more <laughs> financially viable. So that's good as well. I know a lot of people who go base contrast dry, but you know, with that, well actually, no, let me rephrase that. In theory, you go base layer, um, shade dry. You know, you base coat it, you do any layers and highlights, and some people shade after, some people shade before doing the highlights, some people shade after doing the highlights, uh, some people, but you know, in theory, or sorry, you go base shade dry layer that's better i did it the wrong around base shade dry layer but in theory what you do is you base coat it you sh you shade the shadows you dry brush to bring things up um and also helps get rid of some of the um, wash marks that sometimes you get then you use the layer to add your details and to uh, add um some light and some shadows and you can go back with the shade and add further shadows and things like that um, and you can use them in multiple orders I've done a bunch of models recently where what I did was base, dry, layer, and then wash the whole model. Um, and it toned everything down and added an extra layer of shadows, which was the way I intended to do it. So you can use them in other orders and they work. But the the, ba the fundamental order is, as I say, you base wash it, then you shade it, make it darker, you dry brush to bring up the colours, and then you use the layers to add details and some shadow in there. But you can find yourself bouncing between the three. Um... Next, we've got the technicals. Um, the technicals are all the weird paints, like uh, like Nihilac Oxide, like Rise of Rust, like uh, Armageddon Dunes and things like that. <clears throat> there are seven, several technicals, and they have different things that they do. Um, some of them, for example, Blood for the Blood God is not really a paint. It's more of a gloop that you add on to give a, a thick, glistening, bloody feel, and it can create blood drops and can be very raised. You know, so it looks like a raised blood drop because it's slightly thicker than the other paints. Uh, Nihilac Oxide is a very thin paint designed to run and look like oxidization of copper, which, for those of you who don't know what oxidization means, rust. It, copper rusts blue. Uh, not dissimilar to my shirt colour. <clears throat> As I said, when uh, looking at that colour, if you want to know what um, something completely r copper rusted looks like, look at the Statue of Liberty. Um, she, Americans would know that. Um, so, um, yeah, check that out. That's what it looks like, and she is really cool looking. Um, yeah, they also have um, texture paints, which are part of the technical range, which are basically paints with grit, sand, or a sludgy, with, so, well, gritty, sandy, or a sludgy feel, and they're designed to allow you to do bases to mimic mud and things like that. You can put sand on a paint of a sand. You can even mix sand into... A color paint you like to make your own textures but the idea of these is you don't have to again a lot of these technicals they're all ideas that existed before they're all ideas that were on the internet and that people would buy yeah you know, people would buy paint thickener um people would buy um gloss and people would buy red paint and mix them together to create a blood for the blood god kind of feel um what you know a kind of effect and gw saw that and went well that's a lot of work we want you to buy models and paint. We don't want you to be spending time buying stuff of other people, mixing and, pre and prepping things. Here's pots of it for you when you need it. It's quicker. It's easier. Yes, it costs a bit more because when you bought the separate bits, you were buying, you'd often buy large bottles about yay big and you'd make enough to last you a lifetime. But, you know, those bits would be like 10, 20 quid a bowl, but you'd have enough to last for ages. And um, per pot, it's more expensive with GW stuff. But often you only want to use a little bit of it every now and then. Um, you don't want to use the same base for everything. You know, so whilst it works out a little bit more expensive per amount, it actually works out cheaper because you often don't want to use that amount. You want to flip between things. 
Um, so that's cool. We've got the spray cans. <coughs> spray cans are another time saver. Um, <coughs> not all of GW spray cans match their colours at the moment. Some do, and they're a good spray can, so by all means use them. Um, you can spray an army in minutes that would take hours to paint, save you a lot of time. Um, then if you get something like Lead Belcher, because that's a colour that's available independently, you get the lead belt you get the lead belcher spray and the lead belcher paint and if you, you miss bits with the spray because sometimes you do because there'll be a little arm that no matter where you spray you can't get out of the armpit you can fill that up with the paint um some of the colors don't match up um and there are other companies out there for example um army painter every single one of their sprays is matched up to a paint except for the glosses because uh, they're transparent um, so the glosses, except for the varnishes, because they're transparent. So if you want um, to get a bloody red, they do one, um, and they do a paint that matches it. And there's no there's, there's no reason you can't use different paints on GW models. They're both acrylics. Army painters are cheaper. Um, for mo for the most part, I find their paints just as good. Some people disagree. Some people think that GW paints are better. Um, there's Vallejo, which I find to be the best paint. Some people disagree. A lot of it comes down to what you like and what you know. Often with paints, you know what effect you'll get. You know what it will look like. You know what it will dry like. You know whether you need to use three or four layers for a yellow and things like that. And a lot of the time, once you're comfortable with the paint, you won't bother changing because there's no need to go and experiment with a new paint and maybe make 100 models look less good than you want before you know how to use that paint. If you're mass painting. And finally, they've got air. Air is a paint for the airbrushes. It um, it's meant to flow better through airbrushes. Um, I, I've heard some people say it's meant to be you meant to be able to use it straight from the pot, um, but I don't think you do. I think you're still supposed to water it down or um, thin it down a little. Um, but that being said, I use paint thinner and the GW base and layer paints just as much because they're still good and because you know if you're buying a pot of thick paint and looking it down you get a lot more out of it i've always been a bit dubious of the air rangers they're specially formulated people who use them swear by them so they are very good at they are very good at their job but i've always worried a little that you're spending a little more money than perhaps you might need to but again that's uh that's up to you money might not be as much of a constraint for you as it is for me Again, I was foolish and opened my legs, and now I have three spawn to take care of. And then I bought dogs, and now I have two dogs. And uh, in all fairness, I wouldn't change it for a thing, but it does mean I have to count the pennies. Um, next issue, in a surprise to no one, um, we've got more uh, more Repulsor. Um, issue 77 is going to be talking about the Repulsor. Well, it's going to have Repulsor Tank Part 3, Discover the Necrons. They're really cool. And the Repulsor Paint Guide. Then issue 78 is going to have Repulse Tank Part 4. Woo! And a picture of... Oh, no, that is another Repulse Tank. Wow, that looks really different. Um, discover the Inquisition. And the Repulse Tank, Repulse Tank data sheet. So that's another one that's going to be good to look at. The Inquisition are awesome. I look forward to going through much of the insane lore that's um, around the Inquisition and the Gulliver issues. Okay, dokie guys. Um, that's it for this week. I extended the video by ranting about paints a little bit. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope some of what I said was helpful to some of you. And I will see you guys next week or later today if you're tuning into the Mortal Realms cast. Or tuning in if you're watching it when it gets logged on whenever I get around to doing that. Have a nice... Uh, bleh, 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 bleh. Have a nice uh, week, guys, and I'll see you later. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. Not sure why, but I am. Um, so if you like it, see me there and uh, please tell your friends. Thanks very much. Bye.